Welcome back to How Did I Get Here. Now, today on the show, we're joined by the winner of the most recent Samsung Solve for Tomorrow competition, Meg Phillips. She took out the top prize back in 2021 for her groundbreaking idea on solving the issue of roadkill. More on that in a little bit, but first, let's meet her. Let's chat to her. Meg, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Very excited to be here. Thank you. Uh, so I believe you're joining us from Kuala Lumpur today. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, mm. I've actually been living um, over in Singapore sort of for the, for the last year. Um, I was here studying. I did an exchange and I've just been working for six months, uh, but I've just popped over to Kuala Lumpur because it's, uh, it's cheaper to live here than Singapore. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, thank you for joining us from all that distance away. Uh, but we will start off with your early life. Uh, you grew up down in Hobart. Uh, what was life like for you growing up in Tasmania? Uh, life was pretty good. Um, I loved it. I had a really good um, childhood, really enjoyed school. Um, and yeah, I sort of spent a lot of time, I guess, um, in nature, in the outdoors. Um, used to do a lot of uh, camping with my family, which was fun. Uh, yeah, so I think kind of from there I developed um, you know, I really love nature. I really love animals. So I think maybe uh, living in Tasmania kind of helped with that. Um, but yeah, no, life was good. I sort of, I went to an all girls school. Yeah, I really enjoyed maths and science. So I uh, sort of just continued pursuing that um, up until university. Hmm. Uh, I'm always curious about this, you know, coming from a Tasmanian. I myself, you know, I'm a mainlander. Uh, how, how is life just differ growing up down on the island down there? Uh, I don't know. Um, I think uh, it's been interesting actually comparing sort of life in Hobart versus life in sort of Singapore um, and KL because obviously these two are massive cities compared to Hobart. Yeah. So I think um, I think I probably took for advantage um, uh, took for granted. Sorry, um, how nice and quiet sort of Hobart is, um, and it's a very small place. Everyone knows everyone. Um, which is quite nice at times. Um, so yeah, having like this experience over the last year of living in big cities um, has been very interesting. Um, there's definitely sort of a big difference, I guess, in energy in the city. It's quite nice, um, yeah. you know, when you can go out and about in the middle of the night and people are still out. Um, but yeah, yeah, I haven't lived on the mainland just yet. I'll probably be moving, <laughs> um, probably be moving uh, next year actually. So it'll be interesting right, to yeah. actually see what that'll be like. Hmm. So kind of on the topic of Tasmania, I remember I, I visited a couple of years ago, um, I went out and around through the country, and I was uh, pretty shocked, to be honest, by the amount of roadkill that I saw on the side of the roads uh, throughout the country, mm. even compared to, you know, living here in WA. Uh, is that something that you noticed a lot growing up? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, on a lot of these camping trips that I was talking about, like always would see roadkill and um, actually, one of the most exciting parts about the drives was um, we'd be on the lookout always for like echidnas and wombats and things on the way. Um, and it was always very exciting to find them. But um, yeah, I guess kind of the sad part is that a lot of animals get drawn out to the road when there's a lot of roadkill, um, especially Tassie devils since they're carnivorous. Um, yeah, and so every now and then you'd see a live animal, which is very exciting, but there's also so much roadkill all the time. And I think... Probably most people in Tasmania are sort of desensitised to it because, I mean, all the time, wherever you drive, there's always roadkill. Um, it's impossible not to see it when you're out, out on the road. Um, yeah, so it's quite sad. And I think as someone who sort of really, really loves animals, um, it probably kind of affects me more than some other people, I guess. Um, but, yeah, it's definitely something as well that tourists um, – uh, kind of notice as well. I've read quite a few studies about um, sort of how roadkill has affected tourism um, and then even things like um, like insurance costs and economic costs like it's yeah it's a lot of it's a much wider issue than it sort of first um, first appears. Hmm. Uh, so just to preface you know that the chat will have a little bit later about this idea that uh, you came up with for Solve for Tomorrow but uh, did it help you uh, did that kind of perception or did that experience of seeing roadkill, did it help you come up with your idea at that later stage of life? Yeah, I think so. I think um, uh, I sort of always knew that Tasmania was particularly, like had a particularly bad roadkill issue. And I think seeing that firsthand and sort of being, um, you know, growing up with it, it was probably something that I've always been sort of somewhat passionate about, I suppose, even if I'm not thinking about it all the time. Um 
Yeah. So I, I think so in a sort of indirect way. Yeah. Uh, now staying, staying with your early life for a moment, um, of course, we love to hear about students mm-hmm. here at Student Edge. Uh, so if you can explain for us, you know, what, what were you like as a student in high school? <laughs> uh, as a student in high school, uh, I was very, very studious. Um, mm. I put a lot of pressure on myself um, academically, um, so I did quite well. Um, I really enjoyed, um, yeah, maths in particular, um, also sort of science in general. So I sort of, um, yeah, I pretty much followed that all the way through school. But yeah, I was, I was very studious, um, bit of a nerd, I suppose. But um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, but actually, it's been sort of interesting after finishing year 12 and kind of um, taking a step back from, you know, academia is not my entire life anymore. Um, yeah. And I think being the best and being, you know, that's not not so much of an issue anymore. <laughs> so I think you might have uh, spoiled this for us already, but we always ask on this show favourite and least favourite subject. Now, maths and science <laughs> is up there for you. Yeah, for sure. Maths, maths would be number one. The maths number and one and science at a close number two. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, least favourite. Um, probably English. Right, I was not, yeah. not not a fan of English. Yeah, writing has never been my my strong suit. I guess. Yeah, I like I like maths and science because it's black and white. There's right and wrong. I don't like <laughs> I don't like the airy fairy of <laughs> English. Mm. So speaking of that time, you know, when when you start to finish high school, uh, so you make the decision to go on to university and study science and engineering uh, as a double degree. Yeah. How did how did you arrive at that choice? Uh, it took me a while, actually. So right. I actually started off with a science and business degree. Um, I knew that I wanted to do maths. That was kind of a solid, um, a given even. Um, and But I wanted to be able to apply it. So, um, you know, I initially thought engineering and that's kind of what I had in my head. But then I, for some reason, I thought that engineering just meant like building roads which I wasn't interested in. So I ended up going for business and thinking, oh, maybe I'll go into like finance or accounting or something like that. Um, and I hated it. It wasn't for me. Um, <laughs> I think I was probably also fairly burnt out from uh, like from college and high school. So after that, I took a year off uh, and I sort of worked and traveled and I thought a little bit harder about what exactly I wanted to do. Um, and in the end, I kind of was thinking, I was like, if I could do anything and there's like no limits to what I could do. I kind of thought I want to be an astronaut. <laughs> I was actually, right. That was actually my, my first idea. So yeah, I did a bit more research and ended up, yeah, switching over into science and engineering. Um, yeah, and I mean, since studying, I've like explored a whole lot of different paths. So obviously being an astronaut still would be super cool. Um, but yeah, I've got quite a lot of interest areas now. So um, yeah, I've kind of paved the way as I've gone, but um yeah, that's kind of how I got there. <laughs> you might have a, a, a different opinion to me here, but uh, as, a, as a lifelong arts student myself, I look at a double degree mm-hmm. like that, science and engineering, and it looks pretty daunting to me. Uh, is that mm-hmm. something that you felt when you when you undertook that degree? Um, I think so, maybe a little bit. I mean, I was very excited. Um, actually, first year, there was quite a lot of overlap with... Um, uh, especially the maths units that I did. There was a lot of overlap with stuff that I'd done from college. So I actually thought first year was uh, was pretty chill. Um, but then it definitely ramped up a little bit after that. But I was never sort of daunted, I suppose. It's kind of um, you just have to have faith that pretty much you learn what you need to, like all the prerequisite knowledge, and you just keep doing that forever and you just keep building on Um And, you know, it's taken a lot of hard work. It probably comes a little bit easier to me than other people um, because I'm very much sort of a logical thinker, I suppose. Um, But honestly, I really think that studying sort of maths and some of those kind of harder sciences, um, very much accessible to everyone. You just kind of have to start from the start and you just kind of build on kind of indefinitely pretty much. (laughs) Now, as you kind of mentioned there, and and as as you've said to me before this interview, you took something of a non-traditional route, you chopped and changed Mm -hmm. a bit, you you took a gap year. Uh, Looking at your university experience as a whole, including those times away from university, do you think that helped, you know, change and maybe enhance your student experience? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, yeah, taking a year off was probably the best thing I could do to give myself um, like a little bit more clarity, I think, to work out exactly what I wanted to do and to kind of separate my life from, uh, because obviously I had a very big focus on kind of academia, I guess, pretty much up until I was 18. So it was having a year off and traveling and stuff very much opened my eyes to the fact that there's, there's more to life, um, <laughs> uh, which I think is like, it's super important. Um, so I'm glad I sort of learned that lesson eventually. Um, and yeah, I think, um, sort of traveling and working, um, I've also done quite a few internships sort of throughout my degree. Um, it's definitely built up a lot of other skills that have been, um, useful during my studies. I've also been, um, pretty heavily involved with like different societies and clubs and things. Um, at uni, which is a lot of fun. Um, yeah. So it's been, um, I wouldn't change a thing basically. I think, um, uh, yeah, I was just trying to throw myself into every opportunity possible, um, trying to kind of challenge myself kind of personally as much as I could. Um, yeah. And put myself out of my comfort zone. And yeah, I think it's been about six or seven years now since I left high school. Um, and I'm definitely a completely different person. Um, and yeah, pretty, pretty happy with where I'm at. Uh, now, before we do get to the, to the Samsung soul for tomorrow part, something we ask everyone here on the show, and I think it gives us a good insight to who you are as a person, uh, was your first ever job? Oh, my first ever job. Um, oh, I worked in like, uh, a little grocer. Um, it was one of, it was like a fancy little grocer, um, oh. up in, it was the suburb where I lived. I think I started working there when I was 16, I reckon. I remember I was making about $11 an hour. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it was pretty grim. Um, uh, but it was also kind of fun. I quite liked, um, like the repetition of like the opening and closing jobs, that kind of thing. Um, I was pretty useless, uh, at that age <laughs> as well. Um, <laughs> Even uh, sort of when I then kind of worked my way, my way up to like my first internship, like a, with an actual engineering company, I was still useless there. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of why I've tried to do as many internships as possible, just because I, you know, the more you do, the more you learn, obviously, um, and the more comfortable you get, the more comfortable you get. So, um, yeah, yeah. My, I look back on my time at the grocer fondly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think it's it's time for us to get to the fun part. Uh, Samsung, solve for tomorrow. It's this competition. And I'm wondering first, uh, as a previous winner, could you tell us a little bit about the competition? What is it? Yeah, for sure. Um, so pretty much the, um, the scope of the challenge is to come up with some sort of solution to a problem in your local community. Um, yeah, and then I think it was a 60-second, like, video pitch about your idea. And I think it had to be... Um, uh, something unique that sort of hasn't been done before. Um, it has to sort of target the issue, um, be cost effective. Um, yeah, I think those were the main criteria. Hmm. Uh, so how did you first find out about it and what, and what attracted you to it? Um, I'm pretty sure I first saw the ad, uh, on Instagram actually, um, and I was definitely very attracted to the prizes. The prizes were incredible. Um, <laughs> and I mean, I always, I've always really loved doing these kind of design challenge -y kind of things. So it's a nice kind of outlet to be creative, I suppose. Um, I think a lot of the stuff that I've done at university, like a lot of the projects are quite rigid. Um, so it's nice to be given a sort of quite a wide brief and then you can kind of, um, yeah, go from there. So always loved these kind of de design challenges. Um, it was also in the summer holidays. So I had a fair bit of free time. Um, yeah. And I thought, let's give it a crack. Also the fact that it was only like a 60 second video, I was like, okay, it's not like a huge commitment. Like it's, it's quite doable. So yeah. And so let, let's unpack your idea now. So what was the, the winning idea that you came up with? Uh, yeah, so my idea was to um, come up with some sort of device to try and mitigate uh, roadkill, obviously. So um, it kind of has two components. There's a sensor component that senses um, when there's oncoming cars. Um, and then this uh, sets off an alarm 
to uh, with the aim of scaring animals away from the road before the car arrives. So there's kind of the sensor and the alarm modules, and then they communicate with um, uh, the initial pitch was radio, like radio frequency signal. Um, not sure if it's still going to be radio frequency or some other kind of wireless comms, but yeah, that was the the basic idea. Hmm. It's such a it's such a creative and kind of unique idea. How did you first kind of formulate it? Yeah, so um, it was quite an interesting um, kind of design process, I suppose. I was kind of I did a little bit of research into other. Um, you know, technologies that have been um, de been developed kind of to target roadkill because most of the solutions I had heard about had been like um, pretty much just building fences or overpasses, which um, they're super expensive um, and so not really viable in Tassie. Um, so I was looking at, I actually kind of got the idea um, at the time I was working as an intern and I was working with um, like a, an access system and they use those little RFID tags and you tap them and then it like opens the door for you. Um, and so I was trying to think of some kind of like sensor actuator device. And then I kind of took inspiration from this access door and I thought, well, instead of a car, if you can sense that using, you know, some kind of wireless, um, you know, communications signal and then have that set off an alarm, um, I thought that was a good way of kind of removing the sort of human side to the problem because um, a lot of the uh, solutions solutions to roadkill at the moment involve like lowering speed limits and things like that um, or like just human reaction times which are unreliable. So I was trying to look at kind of an animal-focused approach, if that makes sense. Hmm. Very unique problem. Uh, and it's, it's one that I think a lot of people don't think about except for the 30 seconds that you see a dead mm -hmm. animal on the side of the road and the 30 seconds after you drive past it. Was this always the idea you wanted to challenge or did you go through a few different iterations? Uh, yeah, so, that, I mean, that was the final idea, but, yeah, it yeah. took me quite a while to get there. So since my energy, uh, my background has mostly been in, like, energy and sort of um, power, um, I and that's kind of my strong suit, I thought, well, let's, like, have a look at um, some kind of, like little renewable energy systems. So I was playing around with ideas of like micro hydro um, and like different wave kind of energy technology things. Um, but, you know, I have all these ideas. It's easy generating all the ideas, but then like, you know, you try and tear them apart and all of them just kind of, they've either like always either been done before or like economically, it's just not going to happen. Um, or they're not that kind of efficient. Um, I don't know. There's always a lot of holes in these ideas. So, um, yeah, I kind of struggled with that for a little while. And then eventually I thought I need to tackle a different problem. Um, so I sort of thought a little bit more about problems that were specific to Tasmania. Um, and I'd actually just been to um, the Bonorong Wildlife Sanctuary, which is just out of Hobart. Um, they run these little night feeding tours where you go and feed like your kidneys and stuff. Um, super cute. But we uh, learned a little bit about conservation there and they were talking about roadkill. Um, so it was kind of all fresh in my mind at the time. So when I was specifically trying to think, okay, what are some more like Tasmania focused problems? Um, you know, roadkill was the first thing that came to mind. And I was like, um, it's kind of the perfect design opportunity because there hasn't been kind of any very effective solutions um, at the moment. And there hasn't been a lot of progress either. So I thought, you know, this would be something interesting to, um, yeah, look into more. Hmm. Was there like a, a eureka moment at all? Or was it kind of something that you, you kept working away at and then you eventually found the solution through hard work? Um, there was kind of like a couple of small eureka points. I think... Um, uh, when I kind of came up with like the very vague concept, I was trying to see um, if it's actually doable to get long distance um, like wild, wireless communication signals that could go far enough um, that would like give you enough time to kind of scare the animals off the road. Um, so I was looking into like long distance radio frequency signals um, and I worked out that they existed and I was like, okay, yay, like we can move on to the next thing. And so then I was... Um, uh, yeah, I was trying to think about how I could put together like a little prototype um, and I managed to get some little 
bits and pieces that work with like an Arduino microprocessor. And then I sort of put that together and then I had that working as well. And I was like, okay, like I might be onto something here. And then again, I was just trying to poke more holes into the idea and sort of work out where it doesn't work. Um, and yeah, I mean, obviously I knew that it needed a lot of refining and a lot more research, um, but it was pretty watertight and I thought, okay, like this is, this might actually be, be viable. <laughs> and I was, yeah, I felt pretty good about the submission. I was like, yeah, this is, this is a good idea. <laughs> what was that submission process like for you? Uh, it was really straightforward. Um, I'm pretty sure I sort of had my, like got the final concept together. And then that afternoon I went to J car and I bought the little parts for the prototype um, I whipped that up. It was a pretty quick job. I think I stole like a little bit of code from online to like get it to work. <laughs> and so that was like, that was quite fun. I really enjoyed doing that. Um, and then I came up with the script as well. So it was only 60 seconds. So the hardest bit was trying to like, um, hit every criteria and stay within the time limit. So I think it only ended up being maybe like one or two sentences kind of per criteria. Um, but that's kind of good in a way because it means you don't have to go into like so much detail and you don't have to develop so much detail about the idea. It's kind of just very surface level, um, which was where it was at. So, um, so that was good. And then um, I recorded that and then I had to sort of time it with the presentation. Um, yeah. And then um, filled out the little online form and submitted it. And so I think, oh, I think that night, um, I'm pretty sure it was the day before it was due to um, <laughs> um, <laughs> like to leave it to the last minute just to give myself that pressure. Um, yeah. So I think kind of the process of um, putting the whole thing together, it took me a good, maybe like five or six hours one night um, oh, yeah. with kind of on and off, like ideating a few days before that. So um, yeah, it wasn't a huge commitment um, and it was pretty fun to bring it all together. Yeah. Yeah. So from the time you submit it um, to the time when you find out the result, you know, what's, how, how long is that period, first of all? And, you know, are, are you nervous? Are you thinking about it a lot? Um, I think it was about a month. Um, oh. It's actually quite funny. The day before I got the phone call, I just got a parking ticket and it was so unfair because I used the app to pay for the pay for parking, but it didn't go through. And I went back five minutes later and I had the parking ticket and I was like, I was like, that sucks. Um, you know, I'm due for some good, like some good news now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, <laughs> and then, yeah. And then the next day I got the phone call and I was, I'm pretty sure I said to, um, uh, I think I spoke to a, a lady, Sam, and I actually told her that I was like, I knew I was due for some good luck. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I'd sort of been thinking about it kind of on and off. Just, I'm pretty sure I had the, um, uh, like the date that results were coming out. Um, probably my calendar so I could just keep an eye on it. But, um, yeah, I was, I was quite excited. <laughs> uh, aside from maybe the, the karmic retribution from the uh, parking ticket, did you think, <laughs> did, did you, think you were within, with, uh, in with much of a chance? Um, I mean, it's so hard to say without seeing, yeah. um, like, other people's submissions. And, you know, I had no idea how many other submissions there were. Um, didn't get to see them either. Um, I felt pretty confident with the idea and I thought like, um, you know, this is, um, you know, I felt like it hit all the criteria like pretty well. I think it sort of nailed the brief. So I felt quite confident in, in that, but, um, yeah, it was kind of impossible to know without seeing the other, um, uh, submissions, but yeah, no, I felt, I felt pretty confident. Mm. So the grand price uh, comes through ten thousand minus the sixty seventy dollars for the parking ticket, uh, which is a lot of a lot of money for a uni student. Um, what do you? Mm -hmm. what, what is actually then the plan? What do you then go and do with the prize money afterwards? Uh, yeah. So with the prize money, I'm hoping to. I've still got it sort of saved away. I haven't touched it. Yeah. Um, keeping it safe and sound. But I've actually been working on um, on the whole project as my honours project um, yeah. and I'm just about to get back into the second half um, sort of which involves putting together the prototype and testing it. Um, so I think a fair bit of that funding is probably going to go towards that. It's definitely going to take quite a few iterations to get it right um, and I'm hoping to get some like good quality components like um, 
you know, to give it the best shot at working and to sort of meet all the specs and everything. So, yeah, I think probably most of that funding is going to go towards um, prototype building and testing, even sort of beyond my honours. Um, you know, I'm quite keen to keep working at it and get it to a point where I can sort of work it and run, um, yeah, some full-scale trials. Yeah. So, uh, of course, as you mentioned there, you know, you, you take the idea from the initial submission to, to where it is now and it, it's a, it, it is your honours project, uh, I suppose. You know, how do you, how do you evolve the idea since 2021 when you submitted it? Um, yeah, so it's come uh, quite a long way. It's, um, I mean, the same principle, um, it's pretty much the same. Um, but I guess the first steps were um, doing some pretty intense research. So I was looking at just about every other roadkill mitigation strategy. Um, I was looking at, you know, overpasses and things and then kind of why they weren't really suitable, um, uh, you know, in Tasmania, mostly just because they're too expensive. And then I was looking at sort of other similar devices on the market. Um, and so there's quite a few of these devices called virtual fences that um, it's the same sort of premise, um, uh, but there's ones that have been trialled at the moment that detect cars from their headlights and then they play like a high frequency noise. Um, so the first uh, most intense part of my research was actually looking into different um, sort of alarm stimuli and what would be the best thing to use. Um, because most of the papers I read were sort of saying that using like high frequency noises don't actually cause like aversive reactions in animals. Um, so to kind of develop a, a good alarm system, it needs to have biologically significant um, uh, like sounds, like the sounds of predators and things, and that actually causes animals to flee. Um, so that was kind of a really big component. Um, and then stuff like classical conditioning, um, I also studied uh, radio frequency communications um, while I was in Singapore. So, I mean, that was quite fundamental. It was probably about time that I learned that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, what else? Oh, I was looking at different um, uh, like types of sensors, uh, what would be best. So things like infrared and like um, pneumatic tubing. Um, yeah. So yeah, huge, huge research section. Um, and uh, yeah, from that, I kind of worked out what the flaws were in some of the existing devices. Um, so, you know, the headlight sensors, for example, um, they can't detect that far of a, dis a distance. So you still don't really get enough time for animals to react. Um, also a lot of Tasmanian roads are winding and undulating. So again, you know, if someone comes around a corner, there's like, they're useless. Um, and yeah, these high frequency noises don't work. Um, yeah, so there was a lot of room for improvement. So I've kind of worked out exactly what improvements um, I'd like to make. And I've got to the point now where I've pretty much got my, um, my concept together of um, how I can kind of hit all of those um, like design changes. Yeah, so now it's the hard part of actually like ordering the parts and putting it together. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sounds like you've really gotten into the nuts and bolts of it all. Uh, for you, mm -hmm. uh, aspirationally, what's the ultimate dream for this idea, for this project? Uh, ultimately, I'd like it to work, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, which is quite obvious. So it's it's not going to happen in my honours year. Um, it's, yeah, it's sort of become... Um, a bit of a rabbit hole, I suppose, like all this research yeah. and like there are so many factors at play uh, that it's impossible to get it right um, and have like a silver bullet solution that, um, you know, could work anywhere around the world and for different species and whatever. So um, it's very complex, but I do hope to continue. I hope to have a working prototype at the end of the year and then I hope to keep sort of working on that um, kind of in the future, hopefully get some more funding. Um, I've already got quite a lot of contacts um, sort of in the local government and things, people who are quite keen to get it working. Um, yeah, so I think I've got a lot of support and obviously quite a bit of funding now, which is great. Um, yeah, so ideally would like to get it up and running, produce quite a few of the devices and run a full scale trial. And if that works, then start pumping them out around the world. <laughs> now, the Samsung sold for tomorrow, 2023 is underway. Uh, for you as the, as the past winner and someone who's been a part of this whole process before, uh, what mm -hmm. advice would you have for people who might be thinking about or 
or have an idea for this year's competition? Oh, my advice would be uh, probably not to get discouraged um, if it's taking you a really long time to come up with an idea um, that's sort of viable. Uh, for me, it took quite a while um, and it's kind of impossible to know when exactly you're going to have an idea um, that's going to be like solid. Um, so you just kind of have to keep at it and um, uh, keep kind of just have it in the back of your head at all times and kind of take inspiration from uh, just like the little things around you, it's sort of the way I took inspiration um, from like the security system that I was working with at work. Um, you can find kind of similar, um, similar inspiration around the place. Um, and also, uh, so first I was trying to look at different power solutions because that's what I was comfortable with and what I knew the most about. Um, and then I sort of worked out that that wasn't working. I wasn't really getting anywhere. So kind of just had a little refresh and took a different direction. So if you're, if you're sort of getting stuck and you're not making a lot of progress, just completely shift direction. Um, yeah, I think that's yeah probably my best advice. Now, finally, Meg, before I do let you go, uh, another advice question here, but a bit of a different one. It's one we ask everyone here on the show. Your 15 year old self is sitting in front mm -hmm. of you. What advice are you giving her? Uh, I would tell her to chill out a little bit. Um, <laughs> I think I was, uh, I think I was in what year nine or 10 and I was working way, way too hard. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. So I would say, um, don't worry too much kind of about the future and like trying to work out exactly what you want to do. Um, you've got so much time. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm 25 this year, so that's 10 years ago when I'm, you know, still at uni, still, you know, working things out. So, yeah, there's no rush. Um, and, yeah, just have fun and challenge yourself, I think. I think that's been, um, yeah, quite key for me. Hmm. Meg, thank you so much for joining me on How Did I Get Here Today. That is the show for today. Keep an eye out on the Student Edge website. We're going to have a lot more information about this year's Samsung Soul for for tomorrow competition uh, coming up. We're gonna have, we're gonna chat to some other of the runner ups. We're gonna have some more information on the competition itself, advice from other people. It's gonna be a whole suite of things to look out for. So you can find us, studentedge.org is our website, uh, student underscore edge on Instagram, student edge on TikTok, and search us up, student edge. You can find the podcast on YouTube uh, as well. How did I get here? And head to, of course, studentedge.org for all our articles, podcasts, deals, competitions, career tips, education advice, and much, much more. Meg, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. And good luck to everyone who's playing.